Um, when it comes to arthritis, there's three basic types, right? You have um, osteoarthritis. And osteoarthritis, you have to know the etiology, meaning how does the actual condition develop? This is usually caused by wear and tear. Uh, for instance, um, my mother cleaned houses her whole life. And if she was always cleaning houses and you know cleaning windows and all that stuff, her joints articulate a lot. And you gotta understand anytime your bone, uh, your body starts articulating excessively, it grinds down the articulating joints. Well, your body tries to fix it, but unfortunately my mom would work seven, six days a week. And so the articulating joints would always be articulating with one another and the surface tissue would get broken down and you develop bumpy, uneven, um, uh, distal ends of the bones where the joints are at. And that causes a lot of, uh, a lot of friction. It causes a lot of pain. It causes limitations in mobility. So because of that, you develop osteoarthritis. Uh, this is a non-systemic, non-inflammatory condition, and it's typically unilateral, or it can be unilateral, because if you, you over-utilize a specific part of your body, well, then that joint is the one that's gonna get broken down. And as we age older, we have limitations in mobility, and that's what we cause, what we call osteoarthritis. Keep in mind that it's also known as degenerative joint disease, and degenerative meaning that it breaks down over time. Okay, people with OA, they're also going to be um, educated on exercise. But your exercise is more like aerobic exercises. We're talking about swimming, we're talking about bicycling, um, anything that's gonna not put too much strain on the joints but maintain mobility, that's the proper thing to do with these patients. You also have to educate them in a reduction of weight because the the joints that bear most of the weight, your hips and your knees, those are gonna be also put, be put, placed under a lot of pressure because of the articulating joints, and that can lead to OA as well. So if you have a patient who's overweight, you have to educate them to adhere to a dietary plan where they're gonna lose weight so we can stop putting so much strain on those particular joints. When it comes to OA, you have to consider the following as well. Your medical interventions, right? So the mainstay medications is gonna be your NSAIDs. Okay, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we're talking about naproxen, we're talking about ibuprofen, correct? Always consider the following giving NSAIDs. You give it with something to eat, whether it's milk, whether it's some food, because you want to decrease the uh, potential irritation to the gastric lining, and you don't want to cause any irritation. People who will have osteoarthritis in severe cases, they can also, develop, they can also be receiving steroids or corticosteroids. And this is because they're powerful anti-inflammatory drugs. And for instance, my mother, she gets her uh, hydrocortisone injections into her knee because the arthritic pain is severe enough that requires some type of steroids. Consider the side effects of steroid therapy, guys. Fluid retention, hyperglycemia, and depressed immune system, especially when you're taking them for a long period of time. Also for the NSAIDs, consider that COX1 and 2 inhibitors, they decrease the blood flow to the kidneys to some degree. Not, most patients won't have any issues, uh, but if you have somebody with an underlying condition where they may have some kidney issues, you gotta be careful when giving that one because it's gonna reduce the blood flow to the kidneys and those are your patients that are gonna be suffering the consequences when they have susceptibilities to kidney issues, okay? And um, there's one more thing I want to talk about in regards to your data collection. If you consider the fingers, let's just do a little Simpsons hand here with four digits, right? The joints of the phalanges, the proximal and the distal joints, those joints may be developing nodes. Now, I described the continuous articulating joints, right? Your fingers can do the same thing. So when that happens, you wanna note these nodes on the proximal and distal phalanx joints. The proximal ones are known as Bucard nodes, and the ones that are distal are known as Hebert nodes. And so just remember that B, comes before H just as your proximal joint comes before your distal. So that's how you know that those nodes are specific for osteoarthritis. Okay, let's move on to the next condition. The next condition is going to be um, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, 
in rheumatoid arthritis, also known as RA, it's imperative you guys know the etiology, how it develops. This one is an autoimmune issue, which is very different from your um, osteoarthritis. This one is a systemic inflammatory issue. A systemic inflammatory issue that will typically cause bilateral damage to the joint. So if your right knee, your left knee is affected, your right knee is also liable to be affected. Same thing with your elbows, your joints, things like that. These conditions, including osteoarthritis, normally affect your um, your diarthrotic joints, your free movable joints, because those are the ones that are normally affected the most. Okay. So when it comes to uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you will know that the ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, it's gonna be elevated because there's an inflammatory response. You're also gonna be looking for the rheumatoid factor in your bloodstream because that can narrow down or rule out other, uh, other issues that are potentially non-inflammatory, non-systemic, or non-autoimmune. And that's how we can differentiate between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis in regards to diagnostic testing. In rheumatoid arthritis, these patients will suffer a lot from fatigue simply because the patient is consistently in an inflammatory state and their body is always fighting this issue off, so they're gonna be very fatigued because of that, to the point where some of these patients can't even get out of bed and it will require them to be hospitalized to get some type of energy going because they can't even get out of bed because of the excruciating, or excuse me, because of the extreme fatigue. Now, in regards to your data collection, okay, your assessment, what we're gonna know in these patients that have rheumatoid arthritis is they're gonna have deformities of the hands. Okay? Their hands will have ulnar deviations where the fingers start pointing towards the ulna. Um, they're gonna have permanent contractures of the fingers, and it's not so much because of the muscular atrophy, but because of the destruction of the diarthrotic joints. They're gonna have deformity. So because of that, you might consider placing hand braces to maintain the anatomical structure of the hand so you can prevent those particular deformities. In your data collection, this rheumatoid arthritis is not um, specifically affecting the joints. It can affect other issues as well, other tissues as well. That's why we said it's a systemic inflammatory issue. So keep in mind that RA also affects your heart, okay, the covering of the heart, your lungs, your kidneys, and your eyes as well. So we have to continuously monitor the function of kidneys, lungs, heart, and eyes because since it's a systemic inflammatory issue, it's gonna affect those tissues. And that's something you have to be able to educate your patient about because in NCLEX, you have to, you're responsible for coordinated care. You're supposed to be able to educate your patient when they're going out to discharge. And these are some of those elements that you need to focus on so the patient can report any cardiac issues, respiratory issues, any malfunctioning of the kidneys or any visual disturbances because that's essentially what this condition will also be affecting. When it comes to the medical management, you have to consider a couple things first, okay? When it comes to meds, these patients that have rheumatoid arthritis, they're gonna be experiencing morning stiffness, okay? And so the colder the body is, the more difficulty they're gonna have with mobilizing those fingers, those extremities. So you must warm the patient up. You have to educate them on exercising techniques to keep the body's temperature a little bit, you know, not too high, like feverish, but you wanna keep the room at about 75 degrees or so. You have to consider um, morning exercises to help the body begin its day and increase metabolism so they won't have that stiffness. After you consider those elements, we start talking about medications. Now, these patients will be taking NSAIDs, okay? And you have to consider the same elements I discussed in OA, potential kidney issues, gastric issues, give it with food, things like that. But you also have to remember that these medications, they decrease inflammation, but they don't really do anything to that autoimmune issue. So at this point, we start considering big boy drugs, all right? Your corticosteroids. Okay, your corticosteroids are powerful anti-inflammatory drugs and their side effects are profound. We're talking about hyperglycemia, we're talking about fluid retention, and we're talking about depressed immune system. Now this is for when patients are taking steroids 
for a long period of time. But these patients need to take it for a long time because they have significant inflammatory autoimmune issues. And that's how we give them a long-term therapy of corticosteroids, okay? Um, also consider the following. In corticosteroid therapy, it depletes your potassium along with your calcium, so it may lead to bone demineralization as well as Cushing-like symptoms. We'll discuss that in some other video. Now, those drugs are typically pretty decent to give, but the mainstay drug is gonna be your DMARDs. Your disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, primarily methotrexate. Okay, now methotrexate is a high quality, a high priority topic because they ask you so much about it because it's given so frequently. This medication reduces um, bone marrow function. It's a cytotoxic drug, meaning it destroys or slows down cell division. So you're gonna have to consider all cells, all fast dividing cells, they're slowing down, in particular your bone marrow. So you're looking for pancytopenia, a lack of the whole panel of blood cells, which include red blood cells, erythrocytes, platelets, thrombocytes, and white blood cells or leukocytes. So all three of those will be depleted because of this medication because that's what it's doing to regulate or modify the immune system. It's trying to suppress the destruction of the system. As an adverse effect or side effect, you're gonna have those considerations. So look out for symptoms of anemia, fatigue primarily, keep the patient warm, keep the patient, um, give them plenty of rest periods when they develop those symptoms. Uh, any indication of bleeding, report it take measures to prevent potential bleeding, like giving stool softeners so they don't strain, using electric razors instead of the blades, things like that. And then lastly, a lack of white blood cells. So you're gonna be avoiding people who have illness or avoiding large crowded areas and report any indications of infection because that's gonna be a secondary issue that occurs due to the adverse effects of the medication. Also always consider to increase the fluid intake because you have to help the kidneys excrete the metabolites because this drug is very toxic. It's a highly toxic drug, okay? And in essence, that's what you guys have to know about rheumatoid arthritis. But let's talk about the last type of arthritis, which is your gouty arthritis. Now, gouty arthritis is a little bit different simply because it's, an, it's a metabolic issue. What I mean by that is that your body has a hard time excreting uric acid. Normally, you find uric acid in any type of uh, organ meats, seafood, uh, shrimp, alcohol. All of those elements contain uric acid. So you guys have to be able to identify foods that are high in uric acid or what we call purines. Okay. Any food that's high in that content, you need to reduce it, eliminate it from the diet, especially during acute attacks. Anytime the uric acid crystals deposit anywhere in the body, we call that TOFI, okay? And TOFI usually can accumulate on the skin because the body tries to excrete the excessive uric acid crystals. But we all know that TOFI develops where? In the great toe. And the reason why it develops in the great toe, at least based on what I've read, um, is that the distal extremity of the foot, it has the least turbulence and blood flow because it's the furthest away from the heart, and your temperature there is also a bit lower. So because of that, the uric acid, the TOFI, tends to accumulate in those areas where the blood's not moving so fast as it settles, and the temperature is slightly below body temperature, which would be your external, your extremity at the bottom by your feet. The reason why it happens there, not your fingers, is because you're consistently moving your hands and your fingers, and they're kind of working against gravity, with gravity, it just depends, but your feet are always in a dependent position. So that's where all the uric acid crystals deposit. People that have gouty arthritis, they develop the pain more so when they are, usually in the evening time, when they're in bed. Why is that? Because all the settling of the uric acid crystals deposit where they're gonna deposit, great toe, and that's when it causes a lot of pain. So pain is gonna be a huge component of your data collection. Uh, the book discusses gouty arthritis being a 10 out of 10 pain scale, very tender, you even develop ulcerations on the toe. So because of that, when we talk about initial interventions to prevent the pain or to decrease it, we're gonna have to put a bed cradle on the bed. So when we put the sheet over the, over the body, the sheet's going over the actual, um, the, the bed, the foot cradle, excuse me, the foot cradle, 
and it's not putting any pressure on the toes. The toes are so sensitive when you have gouty arthritis that the sheet just laying on top of it causes excruciating pain. Um, so that's why you're going to have to have that foot cradle, okay? Consider the following when it comes to interventions. Okay, we're talking about medications, of course, as well. So you want to increase fluid intake, okay, usually more than two liters a day because it dilutes the uric acid in the circulating body. Therefore, it dilutes them, it prevents them, or it decreases the likelihood of them depositing in any of the joints. But you also want to give medications such as NSAIDs. Okay, your NSAIDs are important. Um, these are more for um, the maintenance of gouty arthritis, um, including allopurinol. Oops, allopurinol. My spelling is sometimes suspicious. But nonetheless, allopurinol NSAIDs, those are usually given for maintenance. Same thing as uh, probenicid. Uh, those medications are very common. They're given for maintenance. But for your acute attacks, you have your colchicine. Okay, colchicine is a very common drug that's given for acute attacks, and we could also give um, steroids or corticosteroids in order to decrease the uh, the exacerbation and the inflammation, and hopefully it'll reduce the pain. Okay, um, make sure you guys know the difference between your mainstay drugs and your acute medications because it'll give you a scenario as you know the patient went to San Pedro and ate all that food at the uh, where they have all that shrimp and stuff, you know. And you, they have those big old micheladas, so you know that they're consuming a lot of uric acid, a lot of purine, so that's your acute attack. You're not gonna be giving your allopurinol, your NSAIDs, because those just decrease the, the accumulation of uric acid. You need something to excrete them during that acute phase, and that's gonna be your medications like colchicine or your steroids, which decrease the inflammation and alleviates the pain. Uh, in essence, guys, that is gouty arthritis. Keep in mind, you have to be able to recognize foods that contain uric acid. We call those purines. Immobility of that great toe is very important because mobilizing it causes more pain, of course. All right, let's move on with the musculoskeletal system. And let's see